Okay, so let's start today. Hello everyone again, and welcome to this week's SETS Online webinar. My name is Mariano Ramirez, and I'm going to moderate this first webinar in 2023. Before we get started with today's talk, we would like to thank our sponsorship from the International Association of Sedimentologists, which allow us to offer all these resources free of charge. Make sure and check out our website for more information on upcoming events and meetings, and see everything available for the sedimentological community. Today's lecture is by Dr. Marjorie Chan from University of Utah. She is a distinguished professor at the Department of Geology at the University of Utah, and she received her Bachelor in Geology at the University of California, Davis, and her PhD in Geology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has led an active research program which studies that apply terrestrial geology to better understand Martian geology. Her research extends from sedimentary geology to geoconservation, geoheritage, and ethics. She has received society awards for being an outstanding educator, lifetime achievement in sedimentary geology, and distinguished service. She has also promoted and supported initiatives for women and diversity for decades and and is a role model and leader in her field. Marjorie has delivered more than 200 guest lectures and keynote addresses around the world, and now she's very happy to include friends from Sets Online. Today, she's going to talk us about sedimentology future, geoheritage, planetary exploration, and technology. So Marjorie, the stage is yours. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me, and I'm pleased to be able to share my perspective on where sedimentology might go in the future. So uh, today I'm going to share basically three main topics. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about the importance of geoheritage, and this has to do with protecting diverse and important geologic landscapes. And then secondly, a window, I think, into the future of sedimentology is really applying our knowledge to planetary exploration. And this involves some of the tantalizing possibilities of searching for life and biosignatures. And then the third window into the future, I think, is, lies in technology. And I think so many people realize the power of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data sharing. And really, that is something that can change our science going forward. So starting first with geoheritage, uh, to define this, geoheritage sites are places or areas of geologic features that have significant scientific, educational, cultural, aesthetic, recreational value, all different kinds of values that collectively make a site important. And geoheritage is becoming a strong movement in the future. One of the reasons why we focus on geoheritage is because to us as geoscientists, we want to preserve some of the best and pristine outcrops. And these are important because these are the places where we might make key discoveries, and it's important to preserve these for future science. Overall, this helps us make connections. We uh, look at the aspects of preservation. We try to enlighten um, our, our colleagues as well as society about what the intrinsic values of these landscapes are and what the impact is on quality of life. If you look at this upper right Venn diagram, you can see geoheritage at the intersection of what science is all about, about um, the intersection of sustainability and resources, as well as intersecting society, people, culture, uh, and their knowledge. And uh, we were just talking a little bit earlier that um, uh, the U.S. has not recently been involved in UNESCO, but we do have some geoheritage movements in the U.S., and we have some areas such as this example, the Keweenaw Peninsula of Michigan, that have been put forward as important geoheritage sites. There are lots of collaborations um, that can happen when we have geoheritage as a uniting theme. Uh, we can integrate across disciplines, uh, including biodiversity, because a lot of the landscapes are places that house um, uh, diverse uh, ecological communities. We can look at social science, data science, all these different kinds of disciplines can be uh, related to geoheritage. We also see that there's global cooperation that can happen. Um, there is a strong international movement, and certainly a lot of geosites are important for tourism. 
And then in, in terms of technology, uh, the more examples that we use from Earth and how to actually maximize our resources can be important. And this also raises the uh, issue of inclusivity, and that when we talk about geoheritage, it's something that belongs to everyone, and we can engage uh, diverse communities and try to make sure that all uh, voices are heard. So just as an example of geoheritage, I want to show uh, a place that I recently was, and this is the place of the Basque Geopark in Zumaya, Spain. And this is a fantastic area of flish, some of the classic examples, and I'm showing this little video on the right, showing some of the uh, Eocene turbidites. And I have to say that being there in person was almost a spiritual experience. It was just so impressive to be able to see it in person. And these uh, areas are important geologic sites to the community. And this particular community has realized it and embraced it. And they've actually set up a lot of signage and the community is very aware of the geologic outcrops and their significance. And here you can see this beautiful coastal exposure showing the Cretaceous uh, Paleogene boundary right about here, where a kayaker conveniently stopped uh, for my picture. And uh, this particular area, I think, is also known because part of Game of Thrones was uh, filmed there. So let's see, going forward, uh, we were able at a meeting to celebrate geoheritage of some of the first important sites. And uh, this, Pat, this Basque Geopark was considered in one of these sites to just really highlight a few areas globally that are significant. And I, I am standing here um, looking at some of these ripples and the, I have to say the tra trace fossils were fantastic. And this is just an example where we can go and really understand the geologic features as well as its importance to the local community. Another uh, area that I think is important is to actually see how we can use geoheritage innovations. And so here's an example of an old limestone quarry in France. And what can you do with an old limestone quarry? Well, there were some ingenious ideas to actually take the quarry walls and actually turn it into a backdrop for art. And so I'm just gonna show this short little video. Um, and you can kind of see that they've had all different kinds of shows and they use the limestone quarry as the backdrop, as the walls, to actually display a multimedia show. And they've had uh, work of many famous artists, rotating shows so people come back and visit. So I think this really kind of shows the creativity when we actually take our geological heritage and actually try to enhance it and find ways to make it relevant to society. So let's see. Another example that I want to talk about in terms of geoheritage is actually when we as scientists use our knowledge and connect other people with the landscape by telling these science stories. And so this was the case where I was contacted by a artist, um, Irene, uh, who lives in Amsterdam, and she wanted to uh, look at areas of why sandstones were different colors. And I said, you could join me out in the field. We went out and we were looking at some of these concretions, which I'm also going to be talking about later. And she got very engaged and excited about the landscape. And so she decided to do one of her art installations about this. The interesting thing is that in these landscapes, these are protected and you aren't supposed to take any samples. So what she decided to do was to actually try to capture that landscape in an art installation. So you cannot remove any of these, but what she did was she examined them. She took careful measurements of the placement of these concretions and you can see her map that is laid out right here um, in a grid area. And essentially what she did was she recreated and made out of clay 
over 500 individual concretions of the same sizes and measurements of the actual um, natural ones that she had observed. And then she laid them out in this installation that was called um, Here and Elsewhere. And so here you can see um, it was amazing how she was able to replicate some of the textures of the concretions. And this actually opened up the opportunity to share the science story with people that were interested in art. And so really by embracing other communities and finding ways to share the story, you actually can evoke different kinds of conversations that hadn't happened before. And I found this to be really exciting for me as a scientist to learn more about other people's perspectives and especially that of an artist. All right, the second window uh, to the future that I wanted to talk about was planetary explorations. And um, in particular, I had been studying landscapes of Southern Utah, and I was interested in these features that we call concretions, which are these cemented mineral masses. And we can actually take these examples to understand the possibility of fluid flow on the planet Mars. So you see these concretions and how they're physically dispersed they aren't normally really touching each other the way detrital grains usually do. And when you look at this image from Mars, where they sent a rover to the place where they knew that there was the mineral hematite. Hematite is a mineral that typically forms in the presence of water. So the idea was if we, if we go to the place where the hematite is, we can essentially follow the water and maybe there's a possibility of finding life. In this example, the iron was concentrated into these spherules, which they nicknamed blueberries. And here there's false color that's superimposed. So the blueberries are actually shown as these yellow dots, but you can see that they are physically dispersed within the outcrop the way that concretions typically are. And weathered out, they make accumulations. And if you could see them with your naked eye because they are hematite, they would have this steel um, blue gray kind of color. So they nicknamed these blueberries because of the color and also because of the way they're dispersed within the outcrop. They kind of look like blueberries in a muffin. So here's an example of how we would use analogs of Earth geology to actually understand um, processes on another planet. Some other analogs are to even look at some of these micro concretions. There were sizes of these cemented mineral masses that were only about a millimeter in diameter, so about the size of a pinhead. And you could see on Earth, some of these concretions, which are very numerous, especially when they're smaller, they're even more numerous than the bigger ones. And these actually get reworked into these ripples. And you can see a cross section of the ripple shown here and how similar it is to the way the winds on Mars have also reworked some of these small forms that they called microberries. So almost the exact same kinds of expression, even in the cross cut of the surface. Another example uh, that's been interesting that I've been involved in is looking at diagenesis and some of the calcium sulfite veins, gypsum veins in Utah. These are from the Triassic Moenkopi formation, and you can see some of these examples here. And these also are used as analogs to understanding similar features on Mars. So you can see that there are these types of veins that occur on Mars. These are also calcium sulfate, although they might be other minerals such as bastonite. But these collectively are indicating low temperature conditions and likely hydraulic fracturing. So again, we're using Earth examples to interpret um, processes on Mars on the right. Some other um, cases that I've looked at in sandstones, and particularly the Navajo sandstone, which is Jurassic in age, uh, has a lot of the concretions, there's oftentimes massive sandstone. And the massive sandstone, which has likely been disrupted by earthquakes or strong ground motion, shows these uh, kinds of patterns of weathering. And you can see these patterns, they almost look like a cauliflower. Um, they have this uh, very rounded kind of texture. And these um, show polygonal types of cracks. The polygonal cracks themselves are actually telling us about weathering and the fact that the surface has been exposed for some significant time and that the rock type, because of the massive um, texture, 
is able to facilitate different tensile stresses. If there were, uh, if it was strongly cross-bedded, you would see that it would have a different type of pattern and it would be more of a rectilinear pattern that was perpendicular to the anisotropy. But from these kinds of examples, we can actually see the same kinds of features on Mars. You see these kinds of polygonal cracks that are covering the surface. This is also a blueberry bearing rock. And you can see smaller uh, sizes kind of nested within some of these larger sizes. And these are important to understand because it's showing how the rock responds to variable weathering conditions. And some of these cracks might actually be sites for life. And certainly on Earth, a lot of these cracks are places where there's preferential water accumulation. Another example of using Earth analogs and sedimentology to interpret um, processes on another planet might be looking at soft sediment deformation. So here in this uh, example of the Jurassic Navajo sandstone right by the Utah-Arizona um, border, you can see from this drone uh, type of image that uh, we have this almost a drape, but um, you can see some of the polygonal and other rectilinear types of weathering patterns. But right in some of these areas, you see abundant soft sediment deformation. And these kinds of swirling patterns can only be created when the sediment is soft and maybe partially liquefied. These aren't tectonic uh, types of folds and such. And so we can use these kinds of examples to actually understand what might be happening on Mars. And so I'm going to show another similar image here of Mars. And you can see these similar types of patterns. So collectively, these are telling us there's been high water table conditions, and maybe there's been some kind of a trigger on Mars. Maybe it's uh, impacts, meteorite impacts, or other types of things that are causing um, the sediments layers to be deformed while they're still not totally liquefied. Um, some other examples related to soft sediment deformation are looking at plastic pipes. So here are some examples um, from the Carmel Formation in Utah. You can see these nice cylindrical forms, and these are areas where there's been liquefaction and fluidization, and some of the uh, sediment has been focused into these cylinders, and they make these kinds of patterns that you can see from these two terrestrial examples. Oftentimes, they're a little bit coarser grained on the outside, um, of, and these kind of weather out so that this is a little bit better cemented and a little bit more resistant to weathering. So these kinds of pipes can be conduits for fluid flow, and you can partly tell that by some of this bleaching um, coloration and probably triggered by strong ground motion. So taking these examples, we see some features on Mars, and these would be from Gale Crater, which seem to show similar types of features. You can see this circular type of arrangement and it seems to be preferentially cemented. And so um, some of the NASA team called this a fire ring because it almost looks like a place where you would sit around and put rocks uh, of a campfire. But you can see some of these kinds of circular patterns. And this also gives us pause to think about whether or not there could be features like plastic pipes on Mars as well. In terms of geomorphology, here's an example of a large uh, weathering pit in the Navajo sandstone. And this is a place where the wind gets funneled on this ridge and it actually comes into this area and it kind of circles around and it erodes and abrades the sides of the walls. You can see some um, concretionary types of forms here and um, uh, the car keys <laughs> for scale, but you can actually see these kinds of tail patterns, which are showing the abrasion and the direction of the wind, um, which is making that trailing pattern behind some of these concretions or, th or these little um, irregularities in the sandstone. And that's right from the walls of this area here. And you can see that in a comparison, this is a totally different scale, but we have a very similar morphology of this um, kind of a castle and a moat uh, type of geometry in Gale Crater on Mars. There was a team that tried to uh, model this and they did some benchtop experiments where they um, were able to come up with the idea of wind being funneled and actually creating this kind of castle and moat geometry, but that was a scale of about 30 centimeters. 
So this earth example on the left is showing a bigger scale, um, 60 by 20 meters. So that's a bigger size than a bench top 30 centimeter size. But yet you can see this large scale of Gale Crater at 154 kilometers in diameter. But an important feature is that um, even though the scales are different, when you do look at some of the images that were taken from these crater walls, you can actually see some of the same types of things of these nodules that seem to show this um, directional weathering uh, pattern from some of the abrasion against the wall. So other examples that um, people have studied are to actually look at deltaic clinoforms. And this is an example from Jezero Crater. Um, you can see that in a recent paper, um, the Mars 2020 team um, and taking the images from the rover Perseverance took images of this area here and interpret these as top sets, four sets, and bottom sets. And so these types of things are telling us about the potential for deltaic bodies and uh, standing bodies of water and deltaic processes on Mars. So planetary explorations are really fueling the search for extraterrestrial life. And we do use Earth analogs, but what we have to remember is that on the planet Earth, we do have a bias. We have a bias where water has been present for um, 3.8 billion years or so. So in a way, when we use Earth analogs, it's really difficult to even know what an abiotic habitable planet might look like. You know, perhaps we can go back to the Precambrian before a lot of life really evolved, but still we have microbial life even in the waters. So to understand um, the search for life, and to use Earth examples, we really have to understand biosignatures um, and how our biosignatures are these biomarkers of past life, how are they actually preserved? So to give you some examples, um, I'm just showing that biosignatures can have a range of different expressions. So here on the right-hand side, you see all the different components uh, shown by these blue arrows that might go into life but life itself might have different expressions. It might have different objects, which are kind of in the center, and maybe those objects are clear fossils, or they could be microbialites, or maybe they might even be concretions. On the, on the other hand, you could have things like mineral patterns or chemical patterns that might actually be showing the presence of life, or you might be able to detect the presence of life through some chemical substances, maybe looking at isotopes or the certain abundances or concentrations of elements and such. So biosignatures can have different types of expressions. And one of the challenges is uh, how do we actually determine physical processes versus those that are maybe biochemically influenced? So here you can see these examples of these paleosols from Western Australia. These are very clearly influenced by the soil forming processes. But yet, on the other hand, we can have iron that forms maybe something like this. And you can see that it's formed on a watch band. We know that a watch band is relatively young. So maybe this is 40 or 50 years old. But the cementation process is probably happening fairly quickly when the conditions are right and perhaps where there are um, microbes in the water that are actually helping the precipitation process. So in all of these kinds of evaluations of thinking about different processes, for us, we can provide some of the sedimentary context that might be very enlightening to making some of the interpretations. We see that um, probably there are different end members. Biosignatures would be on the right where we know that life processes are important and we might have biomarkers. A biosignatures are often difficult to understand because those are non-life processes. We would think of these as maybe being something like igneous, where it's just too hot for life to exist, or maybe some particular sterile conditions that we might have in a laboratory. Maybe those would be abiotic, but there's probably a lot in on Earth and in our understanding that fall in this area of ambiguous, where it's really not clear and this is a field that needs to be explored in the future. 
just to kind of give you some examples that biosignatures may or may not be visible. And just because you don't see it doesn't mean that it's not there. So here's an example of the mineral pyrite, which has this kind of expression. And so we look at this and we might think, oh, that is a physical, you know, um, mineral process. But what if the pyrite's like this, and it might look slightly framboidal um, in a concretion? So is this showing any kind of biosignatures, or is this biologically influenced? It's still the same mineral. Or this pyrite concretion that I'm sitting on, this example from China, you know, is this biomediated? And then if you look at this example on the right, well, here we have this beautiful pyritized crinoid that's attached to a piece of driftwood. And, you know, this is just amazing preservation. It's still the same mineral. So we have this continuum, even within this one mineral pyrite, from where we go from something we might say, oh, we don't think there's any life on the left-hand side, to over here on the right-hand side, where we say, oh, that's clearly related to life. Um, and maybe some of these things in the middle where we might not see an obvious biosignature, maybe life is present. Maybe the preservation of it is not very good, or maybe there's just a little bit, but it's still something that we need to consider. That this, this continuum um, is important to understand and really try to detect where biosignatures um, might be present. So a message that I want to present is that on Earth, life is everywhere. And how do we really... Uh, move forward with evaluating processes when life literally almost contaminates all of the sedimentary environments that we're looking at. And even in this droplet of water uh, in a cave in Hawaii, there are microbes and microorganisms that, were, that are within this drop of water that are undoubtedly influencing the carbonate precipitation. So in order to understand biosignatures, we need the appropriate kinds of instruments. We need to have quantitative metric standards. Um, and so we need some kind of criteria that says, if we go on this side, it's biotic. If we go on that side, it's abiotic. We need context across multiple scales because there are all these uh, different scales from global um, remote sensing images all the way down to looking at things microscopically. And again, sedimentary geologists can contribute here. And then data sharing and management, cyber infrastructure are really going to help us be able to evaluate some of these conditions going forward. So this really brings me to our last topic of technology. What are some of the new directions where, of sedimentary geology, sedimentology in particular, that could go? Um, and certainly, some of the things that you are seeing in your own work are the ideas of open data sharing and how that's really allowing us to make new integrations and making new discoveries, really helping us to visualize some of our data, networking, and even being able to discuss, you know, geology with people uh, around the world, you know, virtually like we are able to do now is really amazing. But we can meet some of the grand challenges of society and our science by using cyber infrastructure. A great example of the success story of big data is that of Robert Hazen and some of his team looking at the evolution of minerals. And some of this is um, told in a number of articles as well as his book, The Story of Earth. But really, if we look at the evolution of minerals, just as an example, we see that the moon has about 300 minerals Mars has about 420 or more minerals, and Earth has more than 5,000 minerals. Now, even though we're all part of this same universe system, um, these different planetary bodies have different types of minerals and different, different amounts. Uh, they didn't all form at the same time. All these minerals didn't all form at the same time. But what we're seeing is that some of these Earth minerals are closely linked to the development of the planet and the evolution of life. So the diversity of earth minerals is really a function of plate tectonics as well as life. And because of the abundance of water and the interactions of life, 
Earth has many more minerals. So this is really um, a story where uh, Bob Hazen's group was able to use big data and deduce this very important concept that now uh, we can use to understand kind of the evolution of life and its relationship to minerals. Um, some other things that are exciting are new applications and those that are on some of our handheld devices. This is one called Rocked or Rock D. And uh, this was from the University of Wisconsin group and Shannon Peters. And you can take uh, different areas, uh, see the geologic map based on your GPS coordinates, and then a stratigraphic column of the geology beneath your feet. I've been involved in a project that was called Strabo Spot, and this was to use a um, field tablet type of device to actually collect data, measure stratigraphic columns, and eventually, hopefully, be able to manage all the data um, in a back end. So here you can see uh, students actually taking strike and dip measurements using their tablets. Um, there are some challenges in that sometimes it's hard to look at our tablets or our devices out in the field in bright sun. So we take other measures, as you can see here. But there are different types of um, uh, programs. And, you know, in the future, as we go forward, we're finding more and more that we want to use these handheld devices really as our field assistant. So now we can actually collect and share more complex data because of digital data management. Here you can see some examples of um, some unusual types of uh, bands here in the, in the cross bedding, compaction bands. And we can actually see that we can take these images, we can measure a section in the field, and we actually might be able to overlay and actually link some of our field photos to these exact spots that we're actually taking them in the field. So it really can change our workflow and how we collect data and then how we can manage it and manipulate it on the back end once we're, uh, we're back from the field. So ideally, it would just be wonderful if all of our geoscience data could be on some type of Google Earth platform. Um, and while Google Earth didn't want to pursue that type of thing, we really are looking at the same type of idea using science uh, data. And the NASA team actually recognized the importance of this. And so they've actually developed different planetary tricks are tracks of actually visualizing the planet and putting all the science information that we know onto these kinds of uh, GIS and visualization platforms. And it's really a way to engage many more people in contributing the data as well as using these platforms. So I just wanted to show an example of how this might work. And this is from the uh, NASA Mars Trek. Whoops, let me go back here. So uh, here you can see um, that there's different ways to visualize it. Um, you can zoom in and you can look at different areas that you want. You can see uh, data that's collected from all the different missions that have been going on. Um, you can actually compare and analyze between different types of data sets. So you can look at one data set, compare it to another. You can use some of the highest resolution satellite imagery, and this would be from some of the high-rise images. You could actually um, go in and maybe do calculations. You could draw a line, and in this case, you can get an instantaneous um, elevation profile. And can you imagine how great it would be to get a cross-section? You can find out where the orbiter is at any particular time. And you can go in and select different areas and even print it out on a 3D printer. And this is technology that's now been available for several years. Another thing that they did was to actually show how you might use data to actually enhance the public engagement. And so in this particular example, you have uh, bookmarks that are different localities from the movie, uh, The Martian. And you can actually see where Mark Watney uh, took his travels uh, to get picked up um, and rescued. And you can see that um, the science data that we have actually kind of enhances um, the science fiction ideas of what could happen, kind of stretching our imagination.
So these are the types of things that are available and could be exciting, particularly if we were able to do this for Earth. Okay, so the bottom line here is that cyber technology and science is a hot field. And really, this is going to allow our science, including sedimentary geology, ways to make new integrations, new discoveries, to actually be able to visualize our data better, which will help us in our interpretations and to assist in networking. It's really exciting to see how cyber technology will change our science in the future. So to summarize what I've been talking about today, um, I think there are some important windows into the future that, that we have to look forward to. Um, number one, I wanna stress that geoheritage is the uniting concept of assessing the landscapes, the values of those, and building community around important geosites. And these are ways that we as scientists should share our knowledge because it will enhance the quality of life for everybody if they understand and appreciate uh, the science that's around them. Number two, uh, planetary exploration is also exciting. And this is a field that's just been really blossoming in the last two decades. And it's exciting to be able to use Earth examples to understand Mars and particularly sedimentary geology. But I think the things that we have to be careful about is that Earth is full of life, and that presents a bit of a bias. We also need to recognize that looking for biosignatures and life detection really requires a sedimentary context. And that's nice that, our, that those kinds of fields going forward are dependent on our field, which is sedimentary geology. The third concept is that technology, such as cyber infrastructure, is going to change our science. So we leverage all of these possibilities of data management and big data, and it will lead to new kinds of discoveries and new insights that were never possible you know, before in some of my career of the past. So I want to encourage us all to expand our vision of the sedimentology futures, I think it's really exciting what's going to happen, and I think the new generation has lots of challenges ahead. It's our responsibility to inspire and train the next generation uh, to share stories as much as we can across society, and I want to also stress that um, diversity and inclusion will be important in the future. So that's my story, and I thank you very much. Here we go. Thank you very much, Marjorie. It was a very interesting talk, very fascinating, super comprehensive, and a lot of topics to discuss um, related to geology. So um, now we are open to questions. So please write your questions in the chat and then be sure to send it to everyone. And also please remember to write your name and where are you watching at? Um, so we already have a question from Stephen from the UK. So I'm going to read the, the question to you, Marjorie. Okay. And Stephen from the UK said, thanks for a terrific talk, fascinating stuff. I really like the Mars Trek software. Is this kind of data considered as open access? For example, can we use it as data sources for research with appropriate cita citation of USB? That is a good, that is a good question. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I, I don't know that it's considered open access, but I think that that's um, something that probably will be incorporated into it in the future. And these are the kinds of conversations that a lot of different groups are talking about. Um, when we have these platforms, how do we evaluate the data that are coming in? Um, and is there some kind of a level of review as well as there is there some kind of level of um, security where you might actually want to say, I'm going to have my data on this platform, but I don't want to release it until I've published my paper or, you know, until you're actually ready to. So I obviously don't know what what that is, but I'm pretty sure that things are going towards that direction. And and um, you you could contact, I think, the team and ask ask about that because it's a good question. But I'm sure that in order to move the science forward, the open access is the ideal to look towards. 
Great, thanks. So we have another question from Jacob Bass from Wales. He says, what is your opinion on open artificial intelligence chat GPT? How useful is it as its present state and could it evolve as a useful tool for geologists in the future? That's another great question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, it's funny because I just got an email this week from a geophysicist, a colleague of mine who teaches a machine learning class uh, in geosciences. And he said, Margie, I want you to try this Jet GPT. Uh, and I had never tried it before. Um, so I actually don't know how it works, um, but it sounds to me, it's sort of like, a, I don't know if it's sort of like a Siri, but maybe somebody else could tell me a little bit more about it. But but I think these, uh, these kinds of things, um, which are tools for us to get information uh, are, are important. And gosh, we use, here, I use iNaturalist, or my husband uses eBird, or we use Merlin, all these different programs to actually help us identify things in the field. And I think that this is a tool that we also want for geoscience in the future. So um, I'm happy if somebody could tell me actually a little bit more about uh, the chat GPT and whether you think it's going to work. Yeah. Artificial intelligence seems to be very important in the near future, actually. Well, we have another question from Chelsea from the US. She said, thanks for the really interesting presentation. You mentioned the necessity of a high water table on Mars based on the soft sediment deformation. Any thoughts on type of on type or characteristics of the water table? Yes, thank you, Chelsea. Um, we have been looking on Earth at some of these examples of Aeolian uh, deposits, these ancient deserts, and it's surprising how many times we're out. And even though you think of this as being a desert, there, there's evidence of the water table. And you can actually see different, um, uh, different preservations of life along certain surfaces that are reflecting the amount of water that was present. And so it does seem that oftentimes the water table was close to the surface. What is interesting is how is the water table fluctuating? Is it fluctuating just as a function of climate or could there be other things going on? And in some cases of the soft sediment deformation that you asked about, we wonder if there could be something like earthquakes or on Mars, could there be some of these meteorite impacts that actually might forcefully um, impact the uh, surface so that it actually changes the water table at that time of impact. Um, so those are some things that might be going on, you know, where normally the water table uh, might not be having the same kind of expression, but there might be some trigger that actually changes the response of the water table. So those are some of the things that we're thinking about. Um, and certainly on Earth, we're trying to look much more carefully at uh, trace fossils and the technology and the communities that get established on certain surfaces because it tells us something about the where the water table is and maybe how much time might be represented at that surface. So thank you. Right. I, I have a question actually. Um, you were talking a little bit about Mars in general and my question would be what do you think are the next challenges for Mars, Mars sedimentology? Oh, gosh, the next challenges for Mars sedimentology. Well, you know, the Mars 2020 mission uh, is caching samples, and we're hoping that at some time in the not too distant future, we'll be able to bring those samples back. And, um, you know, maybe ultimately, if there are a way to make uh, thin sections and be able to microscopically <laughs> look at more on Mars wow. through these robotics, um, that would be uh, very exciting. And it's exciting now that we even have, you know, drone imagery that we can get from, um, from some of the, uh, from Perseverance, you know, and so I think technology is going to continue to miniaturize things and maybe make more analyses ac accessible to us so that we can do some of these more detailed analysis. And I'm hoping that hand in hand, the ideas of biosignatures and how we detect them here on Earth is going to be carried over to really trying to detect those on Mars and other planets. 
Thank you very much. And my last question is like coming back to the very beginning of the presentation, you were talking a little bit more about geoparks. And uh, my question is, um, what is the difference or if you have to define like a difference between a geopark and a national park, which, which would be yeah. the main difference? <laughs> well, um, that's a really interesting question. And I, I have to say, um, things have been challenging in the US in part because of private land ownership. And there's kind of an attitude in the US, if I own the land, I, sh I should be able to do whatever I want with it. But I think the geoparks is actually going beyond that and saying, you know, this, um, this landscape actually is important enough that it really belongs to everybody. Um, and it's not just whoever owns the land. Of course, the landowners have some say in what happens, but we need to look at this bigger picture. Um, in the U.S., we, we were very fortunate to have these parks that were set up at different levels. And national parks are certainly the jewels in, in kind of the crown of the U.S. for some of the most beautiful sites. And it is really amazing how important geology is in our national parks. And yet we don't have enough geologists that are really employed by these parks. And so one of the things that we're really looking towards in the future is that for all of these parks and all of these um, areas that really are dependent on understanding the landscape, geologists need to be involved and they need to be integral. They need to be um, making input into all the planning and the resources. It's just so important and there's not enough of it. Um, so I think the U.S. is entrenched in our existing systems, but globally, the geoparks has is, is really been a strong movement, and it's been exciting to see what's happened. Thank you very much. We have another question from Maria from Norway. She said, thanks for a great talk. I agree that our geoheritage is important and often undercommunicated. How can the value of geoheritage be communicated better to society? Yes, thanks, Maria. <laughs> um, how can our geoheritage be communicated better to society? Um, I think that oftentimes it means that we as scientists have, be, have to go beyond our comfort zone. We have to reach out. And one of the things that uh, we're trying to do at, at my university is we're actually trying to train students more to share their knowledge and their science at different levels. So we're actually putting graduate students in the public school classrooms because they need to be able to tell geology to kids. And the more that we can kind of infiltrate the system of really sharing the story of the importance of geoscience to society at all different levels. And from the kids, especially because they're the ones that are gonna grow up they, they're the ones that might be inspired to take responsibility. Um, and we just have to do that at all these levels. And for me, as a scientist, if I can share my story with an artist, I'm going to do that because it's an important way to reach other people that we might not normally reach. So I think the more that we, as scientists, go beyond our comfort zone, reach out, do as much as you can to be involved. And, and, and it's tough because oftentimes it's not what gets evaluated for a raise or something like that, but it's something that's going to make some of the longest term impact. So um, I'd say find ways to communicate your science however you can and to share uh, you know, your appreciation. And just, I don't know if we have time, but I, I just have sort of one short story I'm not sure if people are familiar, I'm sure you are, with the Antiques Roadshow and that type of evaluation. And I actually kind of say the geologists are like the appraiser. Somebody brings in a, an old book and it doesn't look very exciting and the cover's all beat and tattered. And they said, you know, oh, I've just had this sitting in my attic. And the appraiser looks at it and says, oh, this is a really valuable book. And it's a one of a kind. And it has a history of all of the story from you know page one to page 600. And you are so lucky to have this book. And the education of that makes the owner come away with a new appreciation and they'll value it a lot more. So I think that's sort of our role. Yeah, well, I have to say, I totally agree. It's best way to communicate is just communicate at least, yeah. 
Um, we have another question from Stephen, again, from England. He says, when I see uh, the Perseverance depositing these samples on Mars, I think one good sandstorm and that's blow away and, or buried. <laughs> What's your opinion on that? <laughs> uh, okay, I, I think you mean Perseverance because Opportunity was the, the older rover, but um, right. uh, the, the Mars 2020 um, mission that is, yes, uh, depositing these samples. You know, that's a good question. And I, I think, um, I'm hoping that they're not going to blow away. I don't know exactly, you know, how they're uh, dealing with that, but things change. And so if you actually even take a sample from the subsurface, bring it up to the surface and to cache it, you know, there could be some changes that happen as it interacts with the environment. So there's all those different things. I think we have to just keep track of it. But, you know, again, the more that we understand of how things work on Earth, we might be able to make some interpretations and you might have to back out a couple of, of uh, environmental factors to, to get to where you want to be. But I sure hope the samples um, are recoverable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Marjorie, thank you very much for this very, very interesting talk. Um, we are really happy to have you today. And in, on behalf of all Sets Online team, I want to say thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. And go says online. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for attending this very interesting talk today. And I would like to invite you to our next seminar, which is going to be next month, entitled Where and Why Do Submarine Canyons Develop by Anne Bernhardt. So have everyone a really nice week and see you next webinar.